Hello everyone, welcome to this panel on structures of media ownership. My name is Nika Venema and before we start the panel, we're going to show you a short clip. So if everybody could take their seats, please. Thank you. So that's our host for today, the European Press Prize. Hands up if everybody would already heard of them before. It's not bad. It's also a pretty good rating for those who haven't, because now you have the European Press Prize Awards Excellence in Journalism in Europe and has been kind enough to host this panel today. Um, thank you for that, and thank you all for being here. We're going to be talking a little bit about the roles that foundations can play in media ownership. And I think I'm preaching to the choir when I tell you that uh, journalism and journalism business models are somewhat under pressure. Um, just to name a couple of things that they're facing. Uh, declining trust. Uh, oh, hold on. I'm just going to wait until these people are quiet. Thanks. Um, declining trust, increasing uh, misinformation, uh, declining ad revenues and declining subscribers. So basically the business model is under incredible pressure and therefore also vulnerable for takeovers. So we've seen in the last couple of years and also very recently uh, takeover of, for example, Dogon Media in Turkey, which was just sold to a pro-government group, uh, which uh, part of Dogon Media is Hurriyet Daily and CNN Turk. Now, I'm not sure if that's entirely to be ascribed to the uh, complications that the business model is in, but it sure as hell doesn't help. Um, and then there's the USA, where the Time Group has just been sold to the Koch brothers, who are very close to Donald Trump and his regime. So the pressure that journalism is under is making journalism very vulnerable. Thankfully, and I've been asked to mention this specifically, there are also some great examples of journalism and initiatives that are making use of the disruption, or at least building from the disruption into something new. For example, by collaborating, we all probably know the OCCRP and the ICIJ, and there are incredible new innovative storytelling platforms such as Alazzo and Coda Store. So there's good news, but it's, it's uh, rather fragile. Um, my name is Nika Feynman. I'm the director of the Democracy and Media Foundation. I won't bore you with who I am because you came for the panel for too long, but just to mention, we were funded in the Second World War, 1944, by the founders of a then resistance newspaper. And the founders of this resistance newspaper believed and felt very strongly that commercial ownership of media was part of the problem of why it was so easy for a totalitarian regime to have a grip on Dutch society. And they therefore wanted, after the war was over, for their newspaper to have a non-for-profit owner. And that's where they funded us. Now, there's a long story that comes after that. Uh, but today, in 2018, we're a shareholder of uh, quite a few dailies in the Netherlands, as well as of The Correspondent. And uh, our mission is to promote independent journalism because it is a keystone of society. So... This panel is on foundations such as mine, but not entirely the same, and whether they should safeguard the future of journalism and media, and why they should do so. One example that I'll mention before we start uh, of foundations collaborating on the future of journalism is the European Press Prize, and that is also why they're hosting us here today. The European Press Prize was created by, amongst others, Democracy and Media Foundation, Veronica, Yuri sitting next to me, um, the Guardian Foundation, uh, Reuters is now also involved, and Jepe Politiken in Denmark, and they decided that they wanted to collaborate to safeguard the future of journalism. They created this award to salute and encourage high-quality journalism, um, creating a hallmark for journalism and reinforcing trust that way also by promoting quality journalism. So thank you so much for having us. They, by the way, also inject prize money into the field. I think every 
every winner receives 10,000 euros. So if you are a really good journalist and you haven't yet applied, I would strongly encourage that you do so next year. But for now, let's start on the structures of media ownership. Now, with me are Stephanie Reuters, right over there, from the Rudolf Augstein Foundation, Nishant Lawani from Omidia, and Julie Albrecht from Vereniging Veronica. And I would love each of you, Stephanie, if you could start to explain a little bit uh, the work you do um, and how you support independent journalism through your foundation. Sure. First of all, um, thanks for having me, Nienke. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, the Rudolf Augstein Foundation is a German foundation based in Hamburg. We were established in 2005 and um, I guess um, a lot of you might know Rudolf Augstein himself was a very well-known German, German journalist. Um, he was the founder of Der Spiegel, which is um, the most successful uh, investigative news magazine in Germany. And he went uh, to prison, he was charged for treason um, for publishing an article which was critical. Um, and that's why above all I would say he stands for freedom of the press and critical journalism. And that's exactly what we try to do with the foundation. We try to strengthen the journalistic ecosystem. We try to strengthen critical journalism. Um, we do it through capacity building and supporting journalistic infrastructure. So it means we do not support individual stories. We do not fund content at all. Um, it's also due to our limited resources, of course. Uh, we have a strong geographical focus on German-speaking countries. And we always look for projects that can have leverage effects. Um, I do know it's kind of a venture capitalist buzzword, but it just means um, we try to trigger something bigger with um, our resources. So we watch out for our projects, um, uh, for key points in journalistic infrastructures, I would say, for projects that make smart use of network technologies and that support journalism as such. Um, I can go into more detail later, so yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Nishant Dalwani from uh, Amidyar Network. I'm the director of our independent media program globally. Um, so we fund um, independent media in basically in four areas. Um, the first is investigative journalism, typically non-profit that's hard-hitting, holds power to account on the issues that we really care about. Our largest grant in, in, in that category is ICIJ, um, which, as you all know, did um, the Panama Papers and more recently the Paradise Papers. Um, our second area is we do full-profit investments in new models, financial models for editorial independence. So we're looking for um, experiments or new business models that can allow editorial teams to work independently and effectively. So for example, we funded Scroll in India, um, which is a terrific um, news platform and political analysis platform. The third area is encountering mis and disinformation. Um, so we fund a number of fact-checking groups, for example, Pointer, Africa Check, Full Fact, Checkiado, and others. Um, and we also fund research in that space to try and understand the rapidly changing problem of misinformation. And the fourth area we fund is um, press freedom. Um, so we fund, for example, Reporters Without Borders uh, and Freedom Voices Network in France, among others. Last year, in April, we made a $100 million commitment to funding um, these four areas and others, um, other efforts to fight hate speech over the next three years. And we've spent about 26 or 27 million of that so far in the last year. Um, so we still have a good deal to commit. And that's just over this three year period. We're very committed to um, supporting independent media um, all over the world. Um, yes, um, I'm the chairman of uh, Veronica, and Veronica is um, a media owning um, society, actually. We, um, up until last week, owned a national. Um, news agency ANP, uh, together with uh, Democracy and Media, we uh, were um, owning the NRC Handelsblatt, which is sort of the Frankfurter Allgemeine, as um, a Dutch version of it. And we own several other um, uh, media, smaller media um, outlets. And we've been instrumental in bringing about the European Press Prize. Um, we do give away money, for instance, to the European Press Prize, but what we're really looking for is ownership which um, uh, of media who can find a business model who really to survive to really sustain itself to find a sustainable model for for journalism, because like Ninke pointed out uh, so uh, point, pointedly, um, 
we are moving through, I think, the biggest crisis in journalism ever seen. Um, the founding of journalism is somewhere in the Enlightenment, and I don't think we've seen anything like it we've seen now. And I think, if we look at it, um, it's a prerogative, it's a necessary prerogative for a free and open society, and everybody knows that, but it's one of the few uh, uh, prerogatives for a free and open society. So if we let these happen, and I, I mean, I'm very weary about um, um, big companies like um, Facebook and, of course, Amazon, and although he owns the Washington Post, I think, you know, big business and big government are, you know, um, bleeding journalism white. And I wonder whether we will survive the next sort of 10 years, journalism. And that's vital. I mean, if journalism goes, our open society goes. So um, that's, I think, why we invest in sort of models to see whether you can find a model to, in which, you know, um, journalism can survive. And also, I think it's important to draw attention to excellent journalism. That's why we founded the European Press Prize, because it's important that it's celebrated and it's known and it's translated to other, in other languages. Um, I'm also the chair of the Open Society Foundations in Europe, and we give a lot of money to journalism. I've been pushing for a long time to, um, to, to, that they shift their, their attention also to owning media instead of giving it away to programs or to individual journalists. I haven't been successful in that, but I think this panel is an excellent moment to talk about why it's important, who owns which, me which, which media, which newspaper, which broadcasting system is owned by, by whom. I think that's a very important question for the future of journalism, actually. Thank you to my esteemed colleagues for explaining the work you do and setting the tone. Now, there's also uh, the, the wonderful people of the European Press Prize also made a short movie to illustrate specifically the relevance of ownership of media. So could we look at that? Global media magnet Rupert Murdoch's Sky Italia is preparing to unveil a new movie channel as his latest weapon against the country's prime minister. Why? Silvio Berlusconi's media set is getting ready to launch a satellite platform of his own in competition. Könnten Sie es sich vorstellen, Herr Kollege Mauro, dass der Grund für die komplexe Debatte in Italien darin besteht, dass Italien nach meiner Kenntnis das einzige demokratische Land ist, in dem der größte Medienunternehmer zugleich der Regierungschef ist? Voglio sottolineare che se c'è un dibattito al quale non solo non ci sottrarremmo, ma vorremmo con generosità partecipare, è un dibattito sulla concentrazione dei media in Europa, in Europa, per poter parlare anche del ruolo di Murdoch, per esempio. E soprattutto, ovviamente, e soprattutto, ovviamente, perché non venga utilizzato ad arte questo dibattito per colpire un singolo paese. Vladimir Putin has just signed in a law which raced through Parliament with overwhelming approval. It restricts foreign ownership of media in Russia to 20%. That's a necessary move, says one of the law's architects, at a time when the Russian government feels it's involved in an information war with the West. The reason for setting up a, a trust um, structure was in order to sustain Guardian journalism in perpetuity, which means we were thinking that uh, the philanthropic model and a, a trust model was, was the way to think about sustaining journalism in the long term. Whatever you do, don't create a foundation. So, of course, that's exactly what we did. Thank you. So, just setting the tone there on the relevance of media ownership. Just a, a quick show of hands. Um, who came here specifically for hearing about media ownership rather than just funding? So, ownership rather than funding. And who would be more interested in listening to talking about funding? Because there's a really good session tomorrow morning on that. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to be talking about ownership um, because it's one of the topics that is rarely spoken about but that's increasingly becoming relevant. Um, so I would love to start with you, Nishant. We saw the founder of the foundation you work for, Piero Midiar, uh, founder of eBay also, who made his fortune with a, 
online marketplace, um, talk about how everybody said he shouldn't start a foundation and then he did. So can you elaborate a little bit about what's different when you decide to invest in a media company compared to any other venture capitalist? Sure. I mean, uh, so Pierre was talking about how he, how he didn't, start, he, didn't want, he started a foundation, but he also started um, uh, a risk capital fund, um, which is sort of a patient risk capital fund whereby we can invest equity, debt, convertible notes, and so on. Um, but, you know, there's a huge difference between our expectations and the expectations, I would say, of a venture capitalist. So, um, on multiple dimensions. So, you know, actually, I'm going to talk about an example that I think has proved to be very, very successful, which is not one of our investees, but one of yours. Um, you know, if you'd have come to a venture capitalist in 2013 and said, we're a, few, a bunch of editors, we want to start a new media platform, we haven't published anything under this brand, it's a new brand, we want to crowdfund the money, and we're not going to collect any data at all on our customers, you know, a venture capitalist would have laughed you out of, you know, out of, the, out of his office. Um, but, you know, you took a risk on the correspondent, um, and you allowed them editorial independence, and you were very, very patient, and they've become wildly successful, raising, you know, 1.8 million or whatever in, in eight days in crowdfunding, and now they're almost sustainable. Um, and I think that's actually a terrific example of the role that media funders should play um, in this space. We've made a number of investments um, in really kind of patient full profit, sort of patient investments in, in full profit institutions. They're going to take a long time to kind of come of age. Um, for example, Scroll in India, I mentioned earlier. Um, there's um, uh, Hibisasa in Kenya. Um, and we're looking at organizations like the Ken in India as well. Um, but this is not a time for, to expect financial returns. Uh, this is a time to take bets and take hits because we can afford to do so in order to generate successful experiments that can be used like the correspondent has to inspire lots of other startups. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, Yuri, at Veronica, you just made a really big exit. I'm not sure about the, I don't mean exit as in that it was a huge profit. I don't know about that. I'm not sure. But you did just sell one of the media companies that you owned. Could you speak a little bit about sort of what the strategy of Veronica is when it comes to media ownership? Yeah. Um, um, I think it's, it's very much in line with what you just described. Um, it's obvious that you know we have we should be looking for business models in order to survive the next ten years in in the media landscape, and it's you're not sure where to look for. Um, um, advertisement revenues has been gone. Um, subscription model might be one way forward. Another way forward might be corporations. So it's um, and also maybe concentration because um, and then concentration by whom. You know, that's very important, and I think... Um, Concentration of ownership. Of ownership. Um, you see that in the whole media market in every country. Um, so um, we are looking for opportunities because we do believe we are a child of the 60s. We've been a, a pirate um, on the North Sea. That's how Veronica started. We very much believe in sort of a market-driven media because it has to be consumed by people who want to buy it. Because that's, I think, one of the biggest problems in this time and age. Um, the, the editors of the generation just before us, you know, um, did a very bad thing. They made everything for free. Mm -hmm. So now everybody believes that good journalism is for free. And it's not, of course. It's very costly. It's very important. So we have to go back to a, a, a situation in which the public understands that they need to pay for it. And, um, and that because otherwise it's... Uh, if you're handing out money to, to, to projects, um, it will eventually, um, it needs to be consumed by the public in order to make an impact, in order to be of value in a democratic society. So you need to have a self-sustaining, at least self-sustaining, and doesn't mean have to make a big profit. We're not looking for big profits, and that's, I think, why it's so important that you, know, you invest in experiments, because uh, we... Um, uh, as long as our endowment stays sort of more or less the same, we think it's okay. We don't want to make sort of a, a venture capitalist wants to make 20% profit. We don't. Um, 
uh, but it has to be um, enabled to support itself. And for instance, uh, the National uh, Press Agency we have just sold. We've been own, we've been, we b we've bought it from a um, venture capitalist. I don't think that venture capitalists are the right owners for important news organizations because they need 15 to 25 percent return on their money, which is not the way forward in the moment. And Facebook is you know is is, is grabbing all the advertisement. So. Um, so, um, but on the other hand, it needs to be self-sustaining at least. So you have to look for the right owner. And I think, um, um, for instance, like we together did with NSA Handelsblad, uh, it was owned by a, uh, a private equity firm. We bought fr it from, and we made sure that it found a haven into a secure media organization. I think that's one of the roles you, we, we are looking for as a, as a as Veronica is looking for. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit further on that, because what it sparks for me is that in the, in the 90s and the early 2000s, I think it was very popular to believe that venture capital was actually one of the solutions for the future of journalism, that, you know, to have a big uh, financial injection and to then, but no sort of strategic, uh, well, not, well, financially strategic involvement, but no sort of idealistic involvement was kind of what people in media companies really were looking for. And we saw that. We saw the National Press Agency in the Netherlands was owned by a venture capital. One of the biggest newspapers was owned by a venture capitalist. And now we're here sitting that that's a really bad idea, which is what the founders of the Democracy and Media Foundation said back in 1944 as well. So it's not a new idea, but it's sort of got new fire to it. I was wondering, Stephanie, you're also linked to a foundation that's linked to a legacy uh, media company. Could you reflect a little bit on sort of the historical perspective of media ownership? It's a very good question. Um, well, I would say if we step back and think about why does someone own media, in, in the past it was often due to exert power make a profit, as you already mentioned, or public service. And uh, I mean, of course, the situation in the media markets is pretty different. So in Germany, um, the crisis is not as worse as in the United States or some other countries. Um, so we are kind of lucky. But um, Rudolf Augstein himself, so Der Spiegel, is an interesting model because he decided in the 70s to give half of uh, his company to like the publishing house to his employees because he thought it's really important that you have motivated employees and he thought they should be part of it and he got rich with journalism so he was really lucky but he also had a chance to give something back and that's why he did that and it's a really interesting move uh, i'm not sure if he would do it nowadays again but um, because I mean, the decision structures and everything changes, right? So it's also kind of um, difficult sometimes, um, but that's really interesting. And if we are talking about also um, how foundations can support journalism and if it wouldn't be a good idea that we step up and do more, much more mission and impact investment in the journalistic field, uh, it might also be important to talk about obstacles which we see because, um, I mean, nowadays um, in most of the countries, journalism is not a charitable cause, so it's not recognized as a charitable cause, which means it's not tax deductible, which is kind of an obstacle for um, a lot of foundations. So should we be all be lobbying for that to change, do you feel? I definitely would say yes, yes uh, and yes. we all should do it in all our countries, and we should share our learnings, and we should think about um, strategic alliances um, to bring that forward. Yeah, definitely. So that's one of the obstacles you feel that, yes. that in t terms of ownership, or also in terms of funding media, um, or also in terms of running a media company? Yeah, everything. All of <laughs> those. Be, honestly, yes. And it's, of course, it's uh, different if you're a grant giving foundation, um, although that we are really interested in giving operational long term funding. Um, it's also kind of difficult to convince your board because it's much more risky, of course, and you need much more money um, if you're interested in giving seed funding, risk capital. So um, we are in very early stages, I would say, in Germany. 
in regards to that, yeah. So Rudolf Augstein became very rich by owning a media <laughs> company. Uh, Jeff Bezos has recently bought a media company. We don't know his motivations exactly. Uh, and now Pierre Omidyar is investing in media companies. Are you hoping to become a very rich foundation through that? Um, I, I really doubt it. It's a terrible business. Um, and I, sh I shouldn't really be saying that because I want to encourage more um, investors to come into this space, but it's a terrible business. So how are you going to convince them? <laughs> so, um, well, when, you know, I'm actually going to disagree with you, Stephanie, on the point of kind of the amount of capital you require really to, to set seed funding in motion, set for-profit funding in motion. I mean, as you pointed out, you know, in good quality journalism is really, really expensive. Um, but, you know, journalism that has a revenue model um, over the long run requires less capital um, than, than those that are sustained only through um, non-profit uh, grants like, like ICIJ, for example. Um, and so, you know, really, if we, if we can get more for-profit for funders into this space, then we will, it'll be a virtuous circle. To go back to, go back to the, the question you, you had about venture capital, you know, the reason why venture capital is the wrong um, industry to support media is because they're entirely reliant on exit multiples to generate profit. Um, and if you are not ideologically driven, then, you know, selling your... Um, your, you know, your media company to a pro Modi or pro Erdogan or, you know, any other um, sort of allied um, vested interest um, will make you probably more money than um, holding on to it because it's not the right editorial strategy um, going forward. Um, and in fact, you know, what we need is, a more, is more liquidity in the market for for-profit funders and, and liquidity amongst those that allow for editorial independence in their investees. Um, so really mission-driven investors, because that will allow us to share risk, to invest in more experiments, and to also sell, you know, secondary sales to each other so that, so that actually this is a successful business to invest in. Thank you. I was wondering, for you, Yuri, um, so media ownership is a part of Vereniging Veronica, but it's very strongly driven also by its, I think, a very... Um, committed board, right? Because the Vereniging, it's a community, it's a, but it also has a board that makes investment decisions. Um, you could potentially, being a trust fund, also, you know, give the return on investment to nice projects in the Netherlands and be a happy community that sort of gives money away. Rather than that, you've decided, no, we want to invest in media companies. Now, prior to this discussion starting, you painted a rather bleak picture of the times we're living in. And can you tell us, maybe it's a bit far-fetched, so help me, help me out here, but could you make the link between the bleak picture that you painted when we started and the relevance of media ownership um, rather than just grants? Ah, well, um, um, uh, just because um, I think um, the future of journalism might be bleak, it's very important that Vereniging um, Veronica uh, um, um, or, or Democracy and Media Fund or, or others, you know, um, uh, pay attention to it because it's a crucial, it's a crucial part of what we call uh, our democratic uh, uh, system. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very basic. If we don't um, uh, uh, sustain that, you know, we might think that oil companies are very dangerous, but in a way, um, it's more dangerous, I think, to our way of living and what we call democracy if media companies die. So we need to find a new model. Um, uh, and I think, I don't entirely agree with you on that. I mean, it's important to t get tax breaks for investment in media, but I think it's the wrong end. I mean, it's, I'm not against it at all, but I think that um, uh, where we really have to look for, um, uh, also maybe as uh, foundations, is, um, is the fact that um, the intellectual ownership of everything journalists make you know, is now being used, um, uh, actually mined or used or, or schemed off by uh, big internet companies who um, uh, don't pay the intellectual who writes it, the journalist who writes it, but um, you know, uh, get, all the, get all the advertisement ownership of it. So what we should do is aim actually at the European Union and for national governments to make sure that intellectual ownership is, uh, uh, the, the, is uh, that the revenues out of that are paid, also the advertisement revenues are paid into the, in, uh, to the journalist who's doing it. Because the business model of journalism is already dead. Because if you look at, and I know because we have been the owner of the ANP and the ANP looks into every 
media outlet in because they are all subscribers to the ANP, the national. Um, and if you look at their business model, the, 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 the cents, the 15 cents a word something they pay to the, to the journalist, I mean, it's not enough to, to, to make a living out of it. So that means, if you look at that, that the business model of classical journalism is already dead because, because they pay uh, freelancers something which you can't pay. And that's because um, uh, uh, the revenues, the advertisement revenues, go to the big companies, to the two, one, two, three, four, five big media, big in internet companies. Um, well, Jeff Bezos might be investing back into the Washington Post, and the Washington Post is excellent, but I mean, he's killing off all other. Uh, 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 media outlets in the world. So, I mean, uh, I think that's, uh, that's why... Could you elaborate on that a little bit? It's a bold statement. Aside from the statement that the media business model is already dead, I'd love to hear how Jeff Bezos is killing all the other media. Well, I mean, look at the revenues which have been made on, uh, especially the advertisement revenues, the 80 billion, 80 billion um, uh, advertisement revenues from the Netherlands alone um, uh, last year went to uh, Facebook. That means that there's only 10 billion left for the normal press. I mean, that's, I mean, that's ludicrous. That's theft. And it's even not taxed. It's even worse. I mean, these companies are capable of g getting their revenues in places like uh, the Dutch uh, uh, Zuidas uh, or the Cayman Islands. The business or the, district. <laughs> the, or the Cayman Islands. Or, or, and I mean, it's, I can't, I mean, if we look at media uh, uh, owning uh, uh, societies or, or, or foundations or media or societies and foundations which care about the future of media, it's one, thing to protect, one of the ways to protect it with ownership, I think, and the other is to make sure that the union finally, you know, uh, uh, implements laws for intellectual ownership. I think that's, that's vital, crucial. So we should all be lobbying, really. Yeah, we should all be lobbying. For different things. Yeah. And, and actually, I mean, they're paying you know, us here. I know they are. I yes. mean, that's ludicrous as well. We might be going <laughs> to their drinks tomorrow. I don't know who is. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, they're actually lovely people walking around here, not oh, trying to course, be Of course, of course. Yes. yes. Uh, Stephanie, you know, uh, Yuri disagreed with you a little bit on the tax thing. Do you, would you like to respond to that? Uh, yes. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, because um, a tax status, of course, is not a business model, uh, and we're all pretty well aware of that, right? It's just because you see first examples also in the United States uh, with um, Gary Lanfist and the Philadelphia Media Group, for example, which is a very interesting example, I think. Could you explain a little bit? Um, it's a really interesting example, yeah, indeed. I don't know. Um, who knows that example because Gary Landfest, he was the sole owner of the Philadelphia Media Group and um, it's like the Inquirer, the um, Daily News and Philly.com and he contributed, donated um, the Media Group to a newly found non-profit institute which is called the Landfest Institute and that's um, something, there's a structure with the Philadelphia Community Foundation who was like um, on a meta level. And um, he also endowed that institute with $20 million um, that it can act as a kind of life lab um, for local journalism to experiment with new forms and business models because uh, they all know, of course, that advertising revenues will never come back. So um, I, I think it's an interesting model because it's kind of a trustee structure which you have with The Guardian and a lot of other newspapers. Um, and it's interesting because he tries to make sure that the independence of the uh, media group is um, yeah, saved in perpetuity. And, but they do know that they have to experiment and they have to find new ways to engage with their community. It's also about community engagement, how you... Um, you, you understand journalism, the role of journalism it, itself has to change, so it's very complex, but I think it's a very interesting example. We do not know yet, of course, if it will work out or not, but um, those are exciting examples we, we are following right now, because, um, and, and it's, it's pretty difficult on a local level that might work, and it's a good combination, I think, to think more about um, collaborations between place-based and community foundations and local newspapers. But on a national level, it's super difficult because pretty often you have shareholder structures, right? So how can you um, bring a shareholder structure in a non-profit? That's 
very, very tricky and difficult. Um, but I still think it's an interesting example. So there's complexities, but we can unravel them perhaps and share the yeah. knowledge of yeah. those. So how many of you in the room were aware of the fact that there are foundations that own media? Okay, so actually quite a lot. Yeah. How, for how many of you uh, was that the Scott Trust that owns The Guardian by any chance? No. So there's the Scott Trust that owns The Guardian, which is one of the famous examples, but only Tone in the back knows about that one, apparently. <laughs> you wanted to say something. Yeah, um, and that's a very interesting thing. Um, if you look at the media landscape in the world and the news, land, so where the news is coming from, um, you have, of course, state-owned media, which are BBC or you know, the NOS in Holland or the ZDF in Germany. And that's a very big chunk of what quality news is coming from. And then you have, of course, um, big syndicates like Murdoch uh, Syndicate or something. And in between, there's a tiny slice of quality newspapers in general who are owned by foundations. And, um, uh, and, and actually, if you look at the amount of news which is being produced every day, and which is sort of big news, an, in an incredible amount of the news is made by this tiny um, uh, uh, part in the middle. And that's, um, if, you, if that part in the middle of, for instance, Die Zeit or something is, is ruined or is driven out or is, um, um, uh, then you are left with state-owned state -owned media and big syndicates. And um, um, state-owned media, we thought for a while, you know, are very trustworthy. You had De Rai in Italy and then Berlusconi became uh, prime minister and then he owned suddenly, you know, 80, 90% of every media outlet in the country because he just, you know, put his people in place in the, in the Rai. So, um, so, um, so the, the, the fact that we um, still think that it's a good thing that we have sort of state-owned media is not, I mean, it's not that reassuring anymore. Um, you know, if Wilders becomes uh, the prime minister in Holland, you know, I wouldn't really trust the eight o'clock news. So, um, so you have a big, there's a huge problem on the ownership. You know, we thought, uh, just, for, just a few years ago, we thought that state-owned media were sort of the solution to it, or state-sustained. But then, you know, you have examples as, Hungary, Hungary and Turkey, which is, yeah, yeah, who's going to talk about it? I mean, it's, so it, it's, it's getting more and more um, urgent in a way. And then you have, you have oligarchs buying up sort of uh, uh, state uh, media outlets. And Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos is maybe a good example, but maybe he's not. Maybe he's just the next oligarch. Yeah. You know? Who knows? We'll, we're going to find out with the Washington Post. Yeah, we are. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. we are. <laughs> so, so, okay, so, so you were mind-reading me. Thank you for the alternative. So there's really profit-driven uh, media groups uh, uh, that often concentrate around one individual being like Rupert Murdoch or Berlusconi or a media group like the Bersch Group in the Netherlands. Like, well, they're not just profit-driven, but they are companies that are there for the profit as well. And then the alternative is state-owned media. Now, I'm not sure if we... I mean, I don't know if any, everybody in the room thought that was the solution because history tells us that it's not um, and has been telling us that for a while. Also, one of the problems with state-owned media is that it's not a very sustainable model either, necessarily, because it's, it's, you know, it's not a business model. It's still a subsidy model. But then there's the foundations, and here we are sitting in front of you, and I'd love to hear your questions. I, I have a few more for the panel, and then I'll take yours. Because um, are foundations really the right owners Again, um, in the 90s, my foundation was told by the newspapers that we were a shareholder of that they would love to get rid of those boring foundations who don't really know how to run a media company. So really, are not-for-profit driven people the right people to run a media company, Nishant? What do you think? Um, are you? Well, I'm not a not-for-profit driven person. Um, and I think um, a lot of my colleagues at Media Network um, would say the same about themselves. You know, they come from uh, venture capital, impact investing. Um, they've, like myself, have started companies before um, that are for-profit companies. And so, you know, I think that culture is very, very important as a funder if you are to understand how entrepreneurs grow, um, what coaching they need, what governance they need, how to help them raise money in the future. So I would slightly disagree with the premise uh, I mean, maybe, you know, we're not a typical foundation, um, but, I, you know, certainly if you're investing in for profits, you need to have people who understand that space. What do you think, Stephanie? Well, I would so, uh, say so, too, and it's the same with the Philadelphia Media Group. Don't get me wrong, it's still a for profit, right? And it's the same with The Guardian. There is the Scott Trust, but it's still a for profit. It's just not about profit maximization and the profits go back into the business, which is, I think, really interesting and really good. But 
Um, we haven't uh, even mentioned uh, a few other options like cooperatives, for example, because then you don't have a foundation or um, a mogul or the state who owns um, the publishing house. You have uh, the community that owns it, and that's a really interesting example. And I think they're very, I mean, you're funding the Bristol Cable, which is um, yeah, a, a very good example, I think, of a cooperative, and we have a few cooperatives in Germany too. And we see that more and more um, new media startups, um, they start out as a cooperative and use that model. And I think that's really promising. Shant, you wanted to follow up? Yeah, and I, I agree. I was going to say this sort of a fourth way, right, which is being owned by your readers. Um, and I think that, that can be extremely effective when you, you have a group or a community that is in some way mission driven. You know, um, so those you know, people who own the Bristol Cable, which is a cooperative in the city of Bristol in the UK, city of about 400,000, and they self-select into that ownership because they care about the, the, the lack of local news that preceded the Bristol Cable, and they care about having a voice in how the Cable's editorial strategy operates. What's interesting, though, is that once that grows, um, when do you become essentially a public company? Um, because when you become a public company and you're at that scale, you're going to lose that mission-driven um, core. Um, just by virtue of scale. Um, and eventually people who are investing in you because you're a successful media company, let's say, suddenly you turn the scales to becoming essentially a for-profit public company. So I think one of the things we need to learn by investing in cooperatives is what the optimal size is and what the governance should look like. And can foundations play a role in shaping the governance or is that, isn't that too much interference? Well, I think there's, there's interference and then there's best practice, right? So if we can... You know, we don't, we're an investor in the Bristol Cable, we don't dictate how their membership structure should look. They have complete say over that. Um, in fact, we interfere very little in any part of their operation. Um, we provide them support where they ask for it. And, you know, they can come to their own conclusion, and then hopefully they will share that, and we can share that on their behalf with other analogous investments we make. Thank you. Yuri, do you think there are any risks of mission-driven ownership of media? Oh yeah, there, there are many risks, of course. I mean, there's not one solution to it. And, and I think, in a way, um, um, uh, boards of foundations are not the ideal owners of media companies who need to operate, who need to be really professional. And that's, in a way, why we prefer to sort of buy um, from, from VCs or something, buy something back for society and get it you know, into a bigger media company, because we don't really think that we, as a, as a foundation, are the ideal owners of it. Um, on the other hand, as a foundation, I mean, the interesting thing about journalism is, of course, that uh, many of, one of the many interesting things is that it's, uh, that it's the, the, the servant of two masters, and one of is the market, and the other is the public good, the common good. And that's interesting, and that makes it very complicated. And as a foundation, you can be um, a profit-oriented not for profit, I mean, not for 20% profit, but I mean, with an eye on the market and with an eye on the common good. So for instance, um, you, um, as an owner, you can install, you can, um, you can uh, um, um, ask for editorial independence, and I don't think that's interference. I think you ought to really, you know, uh, lay down an editorial independence sort of, um, uh, uh, um, um, how do you call it, a manifesto or something. And that's what we did when we sold it, um, we uh, explicitly sold it with the manifesto with it, and uh, we knew that we would getting less profit for it. But we, but we insisted that the next owner, and I think you know you did the same with the NSL. I mean, insi insisting that in the contract it's installed, and then um, um, of, of course maybe in a hundred years time you don't have the guarantee, but for quite a while you have. So you can you can you can make a sort of a balance between sort of the market forces and the common good. And in journalism, that's always, the, I think in good journalism, that's always the case. So this is a very clear example of how foundation-owning media companies is, is not just interesting because of the financial part of it or the governance part, but also for the con continuity of independence. Yeah. Are there any examples in either of your foundations of like good practices like this where being in a sort of idealistically driven or mission driven uh, owner can also safeguard the future of, an, of a media outlet? Um, well, yeah, I, I think what matters when you're a foundation is credibility um, when you're an investor because, um, you know, there are benevolent billionaires and then, uh, and then there's the other type, 
Um, and so the non benevolent. Non- yes, yeah, thank you, Yuri. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're putting it so diplomatically. Um, and so, um, yeah, but that takes time. It takes time to build up, um, you know, a portfolio of, you know, essentially references um, of, you, you, know, if you, you know, if you were to go to um, ICAJ or Scroll or um, Sahara Reporters and, and ask them if Midjar Network interferes, I really would hope they would say no. Um, uh, not, not on the editorial side, for sure. Um, and, you know, that's the sort of benign, um, the benign model of credibility. But then your credibility also comes under attack when, you know, there are um, authoritarian dictators and others in the countries you invest in who want to undermine your credibility. Um, so, you know, we've invested in Rappler in the Philippines um, and I've been a long-time investor. Um, and even though we had a very small, we, we just uh, used Filipino depository receipts to fund 5% of the company, um, Duterte called out us as a, having a controlling stake in Rappler um, soon after the Securities and Exchange Commission of the Philippines declared Rappler an illegal entity, declared our investment in them illegal. There's no legal precedent for any of that. Um, and um, it's hard to believe that, that, that it was not politically motivated. Um, and of course, our actions in standing up um, to the powers that be in that situation are nothing compared to the enormous courage that Maria Ressa, who runs Rappler, and her team have had to endure. Um, it's really, really remarkable, uh, not only her actions, but the actions of journalists who are in regimes uh, like that. Um, but we came under a lot of fire, um, you know, it, um, especially um, in Southeast Asia, and it's a difficult position to be in, um, but we have to have the kind of backbone to stand up to that and maintain press freedom, maintain um, our support of Rappler, and maintain our investments in the region as well, um, and not, not be intimidated. Otherwise, um, you know, what's the point of investing in independent media? Thank you. So I realize that I've not stuck to the script at all. And you were probably given the script beforehand, so I apologize for that. Is there anything, uh, Stephanie, that you'd like to reflect on when it comes to this topic that, that I've missed out on before I turn to the public for questions? Well, I would say let's open to the audience, right? Let's do it. Anybody else who feels I've missed out on one of the questions that you felt you should have been asked by me? Yes, you're, of course you do. One, one, th- one thing, I mean, um, I've been sketching some of the bleak picture, but on the other hand, it's the golden age of journalism. I mean, we, we, need to, we need to take that into account because there's uncharted waters on you know, where the world, world is going to and there's a lot of um, uh, power shifting and stuff like that. There's a lot of new... So, in a way, we're very lucky that, that, that journalism is as vibrant as it is. It's, it's really about sort of the market and the ownership and the state which interferes with it. But the journalism itself, the need for journalism has never been bigger. Thank you. So, so we've spoken about different structures of media ownership. And just to summarize a little bit, so there's the legacy media, such as the ones that we're a shareholder of and that Stephanie's foundation is a shareholder of, was, was a shareholder of. Well, we're not a shareholder. No, of used to be, well, used to be a part of, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, um, that, that have sort of been historically linked to foundations. Um, then there's... Uh, benevolence or malevolence, I think the opposite of that was, billionaires who are interested in investing in legacy media. We've got the Lenfus Institute was mentioned, well, he was already the owner, but there's also the Emerson Collective who have bought the Atlantic. Um, And then there's the uh, not so risk averse foundations that are willing to invest in startups uh, and look at investing in a startup in a different way than just to give them a grant, but to say, we're actually investing in you and uh, because we believe that your business model is going to work and we're going to also perhaps help you develop that business model because that's something I realize I haven't touched upon, but I know, Nishant, you do some technical hand-holding as well when you invest in a startup, don't you? Is that something that costs a lot of your time, actually? Yeah, but I don't do all of that myself. Um, So, you know, typically I come across many really phenomenal journalists who've set up an organization, um, a media platform, and it's usually... Um, okay when they start because they're putting out terrific stories, they're doing a lot of investigative or other journalism work, and then they start to grow. And then there are a bunch of journalists who don't know a ton about running an organization. And then they start spending a lot of their time on admin. And then they start writing grant applications. 
and then they stop, you know, and then they get annoyed because they're not able to do the thing that they're really good at. Um, and, um, you know, if you look at, there's data around this. We did a, a report um, called the Inflection Point Report uh, last year, which was a survey of 100 digital native startups in Latin America, and this is just Latin America, but nonetheless, we found that those people, those, sorry, media platforms that had one business development or salesperson had revenues that were 30x, 30x, the, those that had, that had no sales and business development people. So, you know, just putting in, just helping people hire people to who are better at doing their jobs than necessarily they are, um, and help encouraging them to uh, develop their organizations in ways that are pretty rudimentary, uh, which is not, not so much me doing it, but helping them do it, is, um, can be really powerful. Thank you. Um, so I would love to turn to the public to see if there's any questions. And I know there's one question in the audience that I'd like to uh, prioritize. Uh, we've already touched upon the dire situation in Turkey. And I believe that Yufus Baydar is here with us, who has a question. Yes. Well, feel yeah. free, please. Because there's scarce time. That's why, I have, you know, with respect to whatever. Let's respect the time and okay, also give fine. you the floor. Um, Okay, let me take you through the quickly through a tunnel of horror, so you will really realize uh, the, how relevant this this conversation is more than it already is. Uh, it's about the recent takeover of uh, the last remaining limping, however, uh, however limping it is, the huge media company, Doan Media Group in Turkey, uh, and uh, I will update you about this. But you know, the mainly uh, what it's all about, what journalism is all about, you know, just to add to this uh, conversation to begin with, is journalism about two things. Critical coverage of powers of structure and reporting on, on social and pheno scientific phenomena. Regarding the powers of structure, of course, has to do with the big que question at the end of the day, whether or not those covering the powers of structure and corruption and abuses of power are corrupt themselves or not. And uh, corrupt media cannot properly cover corruption. It's as simple as that. And that's what happened in Turkey up until um, 2014 approximately, until after the Gezi Park protests. Turkish media owners were in the business mainly for, um, for prestige, for exercises of power, for uh, being influential in king making and politics, etc., but that pattern started to change, and uh, uh, by the uh, let's say end of this last year, um, the media was more or less up to 60, 70 percent controlled directly or indirectly by Erdogan and his government, and the last remaining. However weak, bastion of semi-independent journalism was the largest group, Doan Media Group. And um, also the patterns changing that those new media owners, after the Gezi Park protests, and this is important to, in this, in, to see how structures of media ownership changes in power grab situations, that those new owners of, of media entered the business by force of the political power you shall own this media group because I want you to own that. And although they don't want to own that, they had to own that because uh, they had the money, they had to serve the powers, whatever the power wants on tray. And um, uh, Doan uh, owner Aydan Doan rejected that idea, uh, remaining still in a limbo, but 10 days ago, uh, he couldn't resist any more, power, any more pressure I think he was threatened. Uh, we don't know that yet, but uh, rumors say that he was uh, not able to resist pressures anymore. And a uh, huge, large, uh, big, big um, media group uh, uh, was sold to nearly $1 billion um, to a sycophant, rather flunky uh, owner uh, family who already owned two newspapers. And that family apparently proved to be very useful uh, for, for, the, for the powers, for AKP government and Erdogan. And um, they had to, you know, inverted commas, they had to buy that media group. Uh, and Doan exiting, leaving with about 2,000 employees, more than that perhaps, seven TV channels, three of them national, and six newspapers, 
More importantly, one alternative independent news agency, which is the only rival to the existing state agency, Anatolian agency, DHA was called, and uh, also equally importantly, distribution network of newspapers. There are two of them. One is pro-government distribution network, the other one is sort of, you know, carrying through the alternative media newspapers as well, as well and digital media platform, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a huge purchase. But the importance of this purchase is, uh, for us, who have been following this case, is Turkish media put uh, in, in, in life support so far until this purchase is now put to sleep. It's over. The game is over in Turkey uh, as of last week. And I am sorry to convey these, these pessimistic views, but this is what happens. This makes this conversation more relevant because there are means and tools and possibilities in, in those areas other than Turkey or Azerbaijan or, or Russia or even, even Egypt, uh, I would say. And it means that those people in mid-level um, foot soldiers, I would say, um, in those uh, newsrooms, they will be most probably kicked out and most probably, most of them will not be able to find any jobs anymore. And uh, this means also that direct control of, of editorial output uh, of the media up to 94%, according to our calculations, uh, will be uh, between the lips of uh, President Erdogan. The remaining tiny uh, newspapers uh, are, are, I would say, not so influential. And the governments in such environments don't care about newspapers anymore. They are not influential. People will read them less and less, uh, uh, these newspapers. The most important outlets are TV channels. Then the, the key is the one who, who, who gets control over the TV medium controls the societies. That's what happened with Putin. That's what's been happening with Erdogan now. So the story with Turkey is almost finished, I would say the last nail in the coffin uh, was, was put uh, in, in its place last week. So, sorry to be pessimistic, but this is the tunnel of honor, error, and then, you know, you can judge it, the entire thing, in a larger context. Thank you. Thank you, Yufus Baydar, who's also a European Press Prize laureate, by the way. And I realize that we, are a little bit short on time, but I'm so glad that you came and told us this and illustrated the direness of the situation. We're not just here to talk about how cool media foundations are or can be, we're also here because media ownership is a very relevant topic to speak about in a fragile situation. Now, I know we only have eight minutes uh, to do Q&A, but the European Press Prize is kind enough to host drinks at the Molachi afterwards. So if you, you know, then want to keep talking, you're very welcome to join. For now, let's see if there's any questions in the audience. I know there's one over there. Hi, um, my name is Simon Galbrin. I uh, run the Community Information Cooperative. We have a, a structure that actually hasn't been brought up yet, um, but um, I'm gonna leave that to the side to talk about, ask a question about um, market concentration. So market concentration in news media is um, uh, something that happened after market concentration began happening in other parts of the uh, economy. Um, so my question is what as a foundation, as an organization that has an endowment, that has investments. What are you doing with your investments to um, fight back against market concentration in other parts of the economy um, in order to, act to, 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 to change the structure of the economy and make it more democratic? Thank you. I also feel that maybe our panel, I, I'm going to keep your question if that's all right with you, might want to re actually reflect perhaps on, uh, on what Yufus just said. Is there anybody that wants to respond to Yufus's statement? I saw you scribbling, Yuri. Ah, well, um, it's, 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 it's so disheartening to hear. I mean, it's so... And um, that's, I mean, you made much more eloquent my point I was trying to make, you know, that, that we need to discuss who owns, you know, the news and who owns the news companies. I mean, and the state is not a solution. 
and a big business is not a solution. I mean, who, what is a solution? I mean, it, of course, I mean, if, if it, and, and in, in this sort of new model of semi-democracies where Putin and Erdogan and, and you know, are, I mean, it becomes even more difficult, become, then it's oligarchs and then it's, and that's why I'm so worried about the United States with, you know, people are, are, are putting their hopes again, I'm saying it again, on Jeff Bezos. But I mean, I mean, look at, you know, how big oligarchs did it in other, other places. It's, you know, it's, uh, thank you very, very much. I mean, but it's, um, it's really, uh, I think it, it underlines what we're talking about, you know. And, and Duterte, where you're talking about, um, or, or, you know, other places, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it, it's important, but it's disheartening. Thank you. Yeah, I think so too. Thanks for sharing your story and uh, um, giving us a bigger picture. Uh, I would say it's also a question of solidarity. It's very important that foundations all over the world um, try to support and fund uh, journalists in exile from Turkey. Uh, we did that in Germany with um, a uh, new startup which was founded by Can um, in with they did it together with Corrective, which is the nonprofit investigative newsroom in Germany. And we were the initial funder because we said we have to step up now and it's a question of press freedom and it's really important that we all show our solidarity to the colleagues in Turkey, but also of course to a lot of other countries because um, unfortunately um, it's not just Turkey, but thanks for sharing your story. Yeah. Thank you. So t t to move on from that very uh, difficult subject to move on from, we have a question on market concentration and what foundations can do to, to push back, fight back. Should I just gather maybe two more questions? I see Leo in the back. Anyone else? You have a question already, I'm sorry. Yes, please ask. Um, yeah, you all acknowledged the urge to um, experience and make a gamble with uh, some, some startups by time, time by time. Um, what does a good startup require in order to be interesting for, for you, for your companies. Thank you. And Leon, perhaps, also? I just wanted to comment on the Turkey situation, but also in relation to this panel. The director of Free Press Unlimited in the Netherlands. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, yes, I'm Leon. Hi. Um, I think, actually, Turkey is a good example of how media in, uh, ownership that is distributed is not a guarantee against authoritarianism and monopolization of ownership. And one of the things that I feel is missing in the perceptions of the panel is that actually if you want to be um, truthful to a diverse mixed media landscape, which I think is what we aim for, that serves democracy, diversity, and a plurality of voices, we need to impose media regulation in a far more uh, advanced stage than believing in the entrepreneurial beneficiaries of uh, uh, investments, etc. We need to make sure that nobody can own the entire media landscape. And I think personally that regulation uh, needs to be getting much more focus. Uh, and I'm interested to hear the comments. Uh, Thank you. So we have three topics for the panel to respond to. There's market concentration and pushing back on that. There's what, uh, what does a good startup do uh, for um, more uh, risk-taking uh, investors and um, reflecting on Leon's last point about regulation. I'm just going to leave it up to you to respond. Can I clarify the question about market concentration? Was it that what are we doing in sectors outside media? I see. Oh, I'm so, sorry, I got that wrong. So, but is your theory of change then that media concentration can be prevented by investing in sectors outside media? Sure. Um, let me. Uh, yes. Right. So, um, media. So the theory of change is that uh, media was local, and then as local businesses became more concentrated, uh, advertising pools also became national. Right. You needed scale. Um, so. Um, when that occurred, adver local advertising pools dried up. Um, so local media just need local media needed to become national and reach scale. And we're seeing the same thing happen. If you look at, you know, this is a pivot in the in the business model to audience driven re audience revenue. And if you market concentration is the greatest driver in of income inequality, and the markets are only continuing to get more concentrated. So I, I agree with Yuri in that I'm really concerned that journalism is not going to be around in a few years unless we begin to fight back against 
the entire economy's market concentration. Um, and as somebody who, as, as organizations who control hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes in investments, I wonder what sort of the comprehensive approach that you might be following is. Yeah, so look, we're just a few foundations, right, trying to be helpful. I mean, <laughs> you know, attacking, reimagining capitalism at that, at that level is probably beyond um, our capability, is certainly beyond our, our capabilities. I think that what, what we can do is um, take on the problem of media directly. Um, as Yuri was saying, the, the advertising model um, is for many, many types of quality media is broken. Um, Facebook and Google are hoovering up, um, I think 99% of the growth in that space over, over the last few quarters, the digital advertising space. Um, and so um, we really have to think about new models um, and supporting new models. Um, and that kind of leads me into kind of to your question about what um, we look for in a startup. It's really three things. Um, first of all, a really clear vision of what they want to offer and to whom. Um, you know, what the value proposition is for their readers. Second um, is editorial independence, you know, and really a clear um, ideologically driven um, editorial strategy. And third is the ability to learn um, because everyone makes mistakes and um, fails at different points and no, no startup will be successful unless they can learn and grow. Thank you, Nishant. Anybody like to respond to Leon's comment? Um, I think they're related, actually, Leon's comment and your comment um, uh, in many ways, because um, um, I do agree with you, um, and I do agree with you. I mean, we're only a few small foundations. I mean, we're not going to take on, but you're absolutely right. I mean, um, the concentration, the monoculture, which is, um, you know, in many places, and agriculture is a, a very good example for that. Um, and it has a totalitarian streak in it, of course, of, and, and we should oppose it. <laughs> but, but we are concentrated on the media. And, you know, we, I think we have a handful of that. So, <laughs> so that's, um, but it's, con it's related to, to Leon's question because um, what do you call media regulation? I mean, I would say that Facebook and Twitter are media. And it's, I mean, I don't know whether you've seen the investigation and, and the, the, the interrogation of Zuckerberg in the Senate, but I was wondering when is one of the senators going to ask him, are you a media company? Because he's saying he's a platform. Well, a platform, in my idea, is a media place. And he's making editorial decisions because I don't know whether you have seen the documentary where, you know, uh, in the Philippines, our people are, you know, yeah. saying yes or no to... I mean, he's making all sorts of editorial decisions all the time. So it's his media. So if you mean that we don't regulate in the union in the first place because we're the biggest place where they operate with the biggest amount of consumers, that we don't regulate that you're absolutely right, and it's related to your question, I don't understand why we don't regulate that. I mean, are they, is Brussels like blind or deaf or, or are they bought or, you know, um, <laughs> what's the problem? I mean, we have all the laws in place. The union is made for consumer protection. That's the real place where the union is working, but it's not doing it. So, hold on, one second though, one second. Can I get the mic back? Um, <laughs> Thank you. So I agree with you if you mean that's no, regulation. I'm close it, so thank you. So I've been warned by the gentleman in the back that I am supposed to round up. So I think Leon and Yuri should continue talking at Molachi, uh, along with all of you. Uh, just to mention, no, we're not a guarantee, but we're pretty sturdy uh, fighting back, perhaps a little bit more than just giving grants. So I hope that's been clear from our perspective. Stephanie, would you like to make a last reflection? I just wanted to add, because I think your question was pretty good, that all foundations should be aware that we have to invest in a socially responsible way, right? And it's getting more and more important, so we have that responsibility too. And it's not just about making, uh, like our grant making, it's also about how we invest our money, because we're just working with interest, which means we do make profits, but we do have to do that in a really responsible way. So I think um, that was really good to add. So I'm glad we started this conversation. Let's continue it next year and at the bar. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Thank you to the panel. Thanks, Nicole.